continue our reading of the reconstruction of religious thought in Islam. <coughs> but after Allah, Muhammad Iqbal, Rahmatullah. So looking at his conception of thought, um, so we just go back a bit, even though we have covered this part, just to keep the continuity. Thought is therefore the whole in its dynamics, um, self expression. We talk about uh, hypostatization of the thought in Alam Iqbal and Hegel um, before appearing to the temporal vision as a series of definite specification which cannot be understood except by a reciprocal reference. Their meaning lies not in their self identity but in the larger whole of in but in the larger whole of which they are specific. They are the specific aspects. So in, in that sense Alam Iqbal as we talked last time is a contextualist. Um, so a particular thought cannot be understood without reference to the whole. Now this whole how large this whole is because the context can be the immediate context you know you can broaden it as much as you want so if you are a hegelian then every thought is connected to the thought, thought as a whole so that's a global con contextualism and alamic valley seems to be you know tilting towards the hegelian global contextualism as we saw in previous videos so thought is uh, therefore the whole in its dynamic self-expression appearing to the temporal vision as a series of Definite specification which cannot be understood except, except by reciprocal references. The reference to the whole. Their meaning lies not in their self identity. So a particular thought cannot be understood in itself but in a larger whole of which they are the specific aspects. Okay, we had covered that much. So we'll go on to the larger whole is to you the chronic metaphor um, uh, as a kind of preserved tablet. So that's Allahum Mahfuz. I think that's from Suratul Buruj. Allahum uh, uh, Mahfuz. So he's saying it's a metaphor, but we don't have uh, any reason to believe that it is a metaphor. It's the name of a reality, the divine reality, <coughs> divine creation, Allahum Mahfuz, as we'll come to it. Sometimes it is, in Quran it's used, Allahum Mahfuz. There's also another word for Umul Kitab. Uh, it's not clear whether Allahum Mahfuz and Umul Kitab are the same thing, but when Quran mentions Allahum Mahfuz, uh, it mentions uh, in the context of the preservation of the Quran by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so the context is totally different and, and these are the series of misinterpretations I will say Iqbal of the Quran uh, Al-Azim Let's try to mis uh, try to interpret Quran to fit it into his Hegelian, Bergsonian, uh, Nietzschean uh, uh, Reinterpretation of Islamic uh, worldview uh, Intentions are as we see it to defend Islam but He makes a lot of mistake in, in doing that which is uh, understandable because the Western civilization or non civilization was very new at the time and the imperialism was in its heyday. But we have to continue Iqbal's work without the compromises he had to make. Okay, so the preserved tablet. Uh, let me see where it is. So, uh, Mahfuz, it is in Suratul Buruj. Um, um, in Tafsir al Muyassar, it says that. Um, hal balag, uh, in Tafsir, Fi Lahi Mahfuz, Hal Balaga Ka Ayyuha Rasulu. خبر الجموع الكافرة المكذبة لأنبيائها فرعون وثمودة وما حل بهم من العذاب والنقال لم يعتبر الكون بذلك بل الذين كفروا في تكسيب متواصل كذاب من قبلهم والله قد أحاط بهم علما وقدرة لا يخفى عليه منهم ومن أعمالهم شيء وليس القرآن so that's the, that's the, this is the context so Quran, وليس القرآن كما دام المكذبون المشركون بأنه شعر وسحر فكذبوه به بل هو قرآن عظيم كريم في لوح محفوظ لا يناله تبديل ولا تحريف so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is <coughs> rejecting the assumptions of the mushrikeen and kuffar that who um, thought that Quran was uh, either poetry or a uh, um, uh, uh, magic and they uh, on that basis they denied the uh, message of Quran but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that Quran is as in the great Quran and the noble Quran it is in Lahi Mahfud in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's preserved tablet that's where it came from through Jibreel to the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it is in Loh Mahfuz, which means that no one can actually change it. So that alludes to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken on himself to preserve this Quran. As against the previous books he sent, he um, gave that responsibility to uh, their corresponding uh, recipients. And they didn't, you know, as we know, um, de uh, they didn't do their duty uh, as it should have been. And they actually changed the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it can't be done uh, with the Quran al azim because it is preserved with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he preserves it in this world as well as as long he wants it and Saadi says uh, Saadi fi lohi mahfuz uh, this Quran Majid is in, in, the, in the preserved tablet uh, min 
وزيادة بالنقص nobody can change it محفوظ من الشياطين so الشياطين can't reach the Allah محفوظ وهو الله المحفوظ الذي قد أثبت الله في هي كل شيء الله إن إن الله محفوظ the preserved of Allah سبحانه وتعالى has written everything now everything mean everything relative to our universe I guess because uh, it doesn't uh, even Allah محفوظ doesn't uh, doesn't encompass Allah سبحانه وتعالى's knowledge so Allah محفوظ is uh, the depository of Allah سبحانه وتعالى's plans for our universe and so this is to show the greatness of uh, al quran al uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, so that, that much is clear this is its uh, tafsir uh, Allah Mahfuz uh, so what is Allah Mahfuz for Iqbal Allah Mahfuz is uh, the depository of this <laughs> holistic thought I guess um, infinite thought um, this larger whole is to use so the larger whole that is the infinite that is the thought as a whole to use a Quranic metaphor is a kind of preserved tablet which holds up the in entire undetermined possibilities of knowledge so that's what he thinks uh, Allah Mahfuz is or Umul Kitab is well let's see so Allah Mahfuz according to Allah Iqbal uh, preserved tablet is Allah uh, Mahfuz which holds up the entire undetermined possibilities of knowledge that doesn't make sense undetermined possibilities of knowledge That doesn't make sense. Um, what we can say is, Allah uh, Mahfuz, especially in Mulkitab, is undetermined possibilities of being. So it is Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala's part of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala's plan in undetermined form, which is determined through um, the passage of time. So every year, and then on Lailatul Qadr, and all those things. So there's different levels of determination according to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala's plan. So some of the determined possibilities are actually actualized. And that exclude other undetermined possibilities according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan. So the Allah uh, Mahfuz are not undetermined possibilities of knowledge. It is undetermined possibilities of being. And it is not the preservation of the Hegelian Geist, uh, which is God itself according to Hegel. Um, but it is uh, part of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan. Uh, and that plan uh, obviously is a part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge. But it also the knowledge of what he is going to do uh, in his universe or part of his universe. Okay, let's continue with it. The way the text, well, text. So, uh, which holds up the entire undetermined, poss undetermined possibilities of knowledge of the present reality. Undetermined possibilities of knowledge, which holds up. Not at the uh, so these are indetermined possibilities of. Uh, of uh, in de in de undetermined possibilities of being undetermined possibilities of being not as present reality they might become present reality according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala some of those undetermined possibilities may become may actualize as present reality revealing itself in several times so this here is going with uh, Hegel's Geist the Geist is revealing itself the holistic thought is revealing itself but Allah Mahfuz is not revealing itself. It is some of it is actualized according to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala's plan. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is the one who is actualizing this with His will in serial time. In serial, as a succession of finite concepts, not a succession of finite concepts. He is talking about finite concept because he is working with Hegel's conception of guys, which is thought thought is conceptual. Um, that is infinite concepts and that uh, reveal itself in finite concepts. So you can see how this uh, misinterpretation is going. Um, so finite concept appearing to reach a uh, unity which is already present in them. them. So they are not revealing uh, themselves, but some of those undetermined possibilities are being actualized in the present according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan. And they have unity, yes, they have unity, but the unity is because their creator is one and it is his plan. So unity comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is an active, active unity, not self-expressive unity, uh, something trying to realize itself through different attempts. Um, yeah, which is all present in, uh, in them. Yeah. 
So there's a lot of misinterpretation here of uh, the Islamic concept in order to hegel or not, he hegelize them. Uh, okay. So if we contrast um, Hegel's Geist, which is the model for Islamic well, as it seems, more or less, um, at this point, you know. So Hegel's Geist is a life spirit, is the whole, the infinite. And basically it is thought. And that's what Hegel's God is too. And this is a God which is completing itself or by expressing itself through time. Through, so the finite is expressing itself through, uh, infinite is expressing in itself in through finite attempts to realizing itself. And that's what history is. So it is revealing itself, it is self-expression, it's self, whatever, however you want to understand it. So it's, it's uh, finite attempts cannot be understood without uh, reference, referencing back or referring back to its whole, which is present as a potential at the starting point. So that's the Hegelian Iqbal, uh, Iqbalian conception of God's thought, infinite thought, and everything else is universe, social world, etc. It's that self-expression of that initial thought. So this is uh, God in that. So now he's saying this is preserved tablet, like a law of mafuz. And that law of mafuz is undetermined possibilities of knowledge, he's saying. But they are undetermined possibilities of being, not knowledge. It is the knowledge of God. It's a, his plan uh, his, partial, his plan or part of his plan about our universe. And whatever is in preserved tablet, it uh, is undetermined possibility. Some of them become actualities according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan. So they are not revealing, this preserved tab tablet is not revealing itself. It is being actualized by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his plan, through his, you know, uh, workers, you know, through his, uh, you know, um, angels and whoever, you know, he uh, deputes those plans to and they become some of them become actual, actual are actualized in the present reality, um, according to his will, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they're totally different concepts uh, which is trying to merge here. And and obviously it's a philosophical exercise. So I'm, I'm sure he doesn't believe that guys to the guard, but you know, when people are philosophizing, they can say they can get into silly modes. Uh, and his intentions are obviously to defend Islam as he see fits in there, but obviously he's making a mistake here, and we should be aware of that. And so we shouldn't, we wouldn't make this mistake again, inshallah. So after um, trying to establish this um, as Hegelian or pseudo-Hegelian concept uh, through a misinterpretation of the Quran, now he is criticizing Kant and Ghazali because he thinks Kant and Ghazali have similar sort of um, views on these points. Um, but we have talked about this before, so we don't need to go into that. But we'll just uh, try to go through the text and see if there is anything to be added. Okay, so. Um, so in terms of appearing to reach a unity which is already present in them, it, in fact, the presence of this total infinite in the movement of knowledge. So obviously if you think that um, <clears throat> this total infinite is all that it is, and it is realizing itself or revealing itself, then that total infinite is always present in these finite uh, self-revelations. Uh, and you cannot understand that total infinite without, I mean, this uh, finite self-revelation without referring back to that context, so that's obvious, but that's a Hegelian philosophy, nothing to do with Islam. Movement of knowledge that makes a finite thinking possible, finite thinking possible, so is uh, there at the level of thought, but uh, if you're a Hegelian, there's no distinction between thought and, because the reality is expression of thought, uh, whether it is natural reality or social reality, so thinking is all there is, and being is, you know, self-expression of thinking and things like that. Um, both Kant and Ghazali fail to see that, uh, okay, thought. This infinite thought and very act of knowledge passes beyond its own finitude. No, Ghazali and Kant didn't fail to see that, uh, but um, Ghazali especially didn't think that uh, knowledge is a uh, geist re revealing itself. You know, the knowledge is related to truth, not thought, and in the act of knowledge. Um, Thought goes beyond its uh, finitude to, into another finitude. So, th the act of thinking is the act of self transcendence. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the initial thinking was infinite or um, thought is infinite. It just means that you go from one finitude to another finitude. And that's the human reality. <laughs> the finitude of nature are recipro 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 reciprocally exclusive. That's because they are real finitudes. <laughs> um, so, for example, my glass and my water they exclude each other. Uh, not so the finitude of thought, which 
in its essential nature is incapable of limitation. That's true. That's why uh, and because thought is related to a freedom and Kant and uh, Ghazali <laughs> both realizes, both know that. In fact, Kant says that and Ghazali says that uh, in their own way. So um, thought is incapable um, of limitation and cannot remain in prison in the narrow circle of its own individuality. That's why it can make mistakes. <laughs> That's why thought can sometimes catch the reality, sometimes just create its own reality, like Im imaginary reality, fiction and all that. That's what we call figments of thought. Uh, and that freedom is the gulf between thought and reality. And that's what is um, what makes possible us knowledge and truth as well as error. So they are all closely related to each other. And both Ghazali and Khan know that. <laughs> oh God. In in the void world, um, beyond itself, nothing is alien to it, alien to thought. I mean, it depends on what you mean by alien. Um, obviously, in Hegelian Marxist um, world, alien means that you know, if thought thinks that being is something not created by it or not its own self-expression, then it cannot realize itself in that being. So it is alienated in that way. So that's one conception of alienation. But um, you don't have to actually believe that thought and being are, you know, ultimately a unity in order to overcome this sort of alienation. Firstly, you don't have to believe uh, in self-creation in that way. Um, and we, as Muslims, don't. Um, um, and if you think that, you know, capability of thought and freedom is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the reality is haq, is the truth and you, you, you are searching for that reality and you, when you come to realize that reality you accept the truth, you accept the limits even though you can transgress those limits that's your abdiyat that's your being a willing slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and if you don't accept it then you are a form of shaitan you know, because shaitan means transgression um, so that's, that's a totally different concept from Hegel um, so in the wide world, beyond itself, nothing is alien to it. It is in its progressive participation. In the, okay, so I think we should stop here and we'll continue from here because there's a lot of, need, a lot of things to say on that. Okay. Oh, subhanAllah, wa bihamdi, subhanAllah, wa alayhi wa sallam. Allah, Muhammad, wa alayhi wa sallam.